Welcome to our new Bible study from Pine Valley Church of Christ, in which we will be looking at Paul's letter to the church in Colossae. It's an interesting situation because, as far as we know, Paul never traveled to Colossae. Uh, we find out in his letter to the Colossians that uh, the gospel had been taken to them by, by one of their own people, Paul says in chapter 4, uh, Epaphras. And apparently he had gone at some point to Ephesus uh, while Paul was there. And we are told in Acts chapter 19, verse 10, where it is describing Paul's journey to Ephesus, that this went on for a couple of years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of God. And this would in, have included those cities in the Lycus Valley, such as Heropolis, Colossae, and Laodicea. In the meantime, apparently there have, that Paul has been gone, there has been some new teachers come in who are disturbing the young Christians there and their understanding of things. And it is for that reason, Paul decides to write this letter. A little bit more in terms of the background. When Paul was in Ephesus, we were, it was probably between uh, 52 and 55 AD by our best estimation. The, Paul writes these letter, this letter, as well as the letters to Ephesus and uh, Philemon and Philippians during his time of the two-year house arrest in Rome. And so there's, especially between Colossians and Ephesians, there's a lot of similarities, but then there's also the distinctions between the different situations in which he is addressing. And in Colossians, it seems to be centered around this idea that some other teachers who have come in who are trying to discredit Paul and Epaphras and that they have not presented to them the full gospel, that there is more for them to come to understand, and they are the ones who can present that to them rather than what ha they have already heard. And Paul assures the Christians in this letter, no, they have heard everything they need. And it all centers on Jesus Christ and what he has revealed and not what humans can reveal. So I'm going to move us over to our screen share as we'll get started with this. I have entitled this series, uh, All You Need Is Jesus, because that's Paul's basic focus in this. And it begins with a discussion of, I've titled it, Diet and Exercise. Make sure you're eating the right kind of diet and that you are then using that to exercise, to use your faith to serve others. And that is Paul's emphasis throughout. And it is not the emphasis of these new teachers who have come in. Uh, it, something we understand in our world that uh, diet and exercise must go together. A lot of people talk about going on a diet. And yet all of us are on a diet and it's either a good diet or it's a bad diet. We all have a diet. But Paul emphasizes to these early Christians that uh, the importance of the right kind of healthy diet and putting it into practice in exercise, because it doesn't matter uh, what kind of diet you're eating. If you don't get the right kind of exercise, you're not going to be as healthy as you could. And you can't, continually exercise without eating properly. Uh, the two things must go together or you will not be healthy physically. And it's the same thing spiritually as Paul is going to emphasize to them throughout this letter. And so from the very beginning, he begins to introduce himself and the situation and remind them of who he is because we find out in chapter two, Paul has never been there. 
Now, there's a lot of people there who have never met him personally. And so he wants them to understand he has received this report uh, that he and Timothy, uh, who had worked together in Ephesus for a long period of time, have received this report from Epaphras, the one who had shared the gospel with them. And But he wants to make sure they understand the authority with which they come, that he is an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. This is not something Paul chose. In fact, we know from his own accounts of his conversion story that he was actively persecuting the early church. But when Jesus appeared to him on the Damascus Road and changed the direction of his life, he reminds them, and we're going to see this uh, time and again throughout this letter, that the, all everything he's doing is not something he determined, but it's the will of God. It's his calling. I uh, often have uh, young people who are considering going into full-time ministry, come to me and ask me, how do you know? And I tell them, unless you truly believe you're being called to this by God, uh, and not because you want to be a famous preacher or popular or anything else, but that this is the will of God, and you simply cannot do anything else because this is what God wants you to do. Don't do it. This is how Paul <laughs> truly feels. Why Saul became Paul. By the will of God. As he was told what he was to do to go to the Gentiles. The most unlikely of people to do so as he was, as he refers to himself in Galatians, uh, a Jew among Jews. He, that was his background. Everything he had been taught told him it was wrong to go fellowship with uh, Gentiles, to eat with Gentiles, to be with Gentiles, to present the word of God to Gentiles. But that is the will of God in his life. And so he now, he introduced, he refers to them as the holy and faithful brothers in Colossae the holy and the faithful. What a beautiful description. It would be a wonderful thing if all Christians and congregations sought this as their purpose statement, that we are going to be the holy and faithful family. And he's going to help us better understand what that means as we go throughout the letter. And this is specifically to Colossae, though we're going to see later he's going to tell them that they should read the letter that he had written to Laodicea, which we do not have a copy of, and that they should share their letter with those people in Laodicea. And we'll discuss that more at a later time. But this is how he introduces this whole letter, very familiar form uh, for Paul and letters written in his day and time, but making sure they understand who it is who's writing to them. And in the middle of it all is that this is the will of God for Paul to be part of their lives and sharing the gospel with them. He goes on in the verses to come to talk about what it is to be true Christians, and what the true gospel is. And this is important for us to come to understand because it's there's a lot of confusion out there in the world. Uh, what is it to be a real Christian? What is the true gospel? Some want to take things away from it. Others want to add things to it. And this will be a major part of our discussion as we go through this. What does it mean to truly be just a Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ, based on what is the true gospel that we have heard 
and not what other people are telling us it is, but what we find uh, specifically from Jesus and his apostles. So he begins, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you because we have heard of your faith in Jesus Christ and of the love you have for all the saints, the faith and love that spring from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven and that you have already heard about in the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you all over the world. This gospel is bearing fruit and growing. It is just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and understood God's grace in all its truth. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf and who also told us of your love in the spirit. We have heard Epaphras apparently has come to Rome as we see, we'll see in chapter four, and brought him this report of what's going on. We have heard about their love and faith and hope. It's in a different order than he uses in other of his letters, but faith, hope, and love are very common in Paul's understanding and writing of letters as the central core of not only what they should believe, but how they should live. And this becomes for Paul, and should be for us as well, sort of the earmarks of what true Christians are. They are people of love, they are people of faith, they are people of hope. And this is how he addresses them in their life as Christians in Colossae because they have believed the truth, which is the gospel. And which he goes on to say is bearing fruit in all the world and has been heard and you have heard and understood God's grace. There is the heart of the gospel right there. God's grace. As he writes to the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 2, he reminds them they had all been separated from God. They had been sinners, but they had now been saved by grace through faith. Not anything that we do on our own, but by the grace of God that has been demonstrated through his son, Jesus Christ. There is the heart of the gospel. God in the flesh. God among us, sharing what it is to fulfill the law, to truly live according to the love of God, to love God with everything we have and to love our neighbors as ourselves, and within our fellowship, to love each other as Christ has loved us. These are the guiding principles. Paul, in his own ministry, kept the gospel very simple. It was about the life of Jesus, his death, burial, and resurrection, his resurrection being witnessed by many, and that now he had seen the vision of the resurrected Jesus in his own life. It all comes from the love and grace of God and understanding God's grace. It's very easy for us, even today, to turn Christianity into something that is about law keeping, uh, checking off a checklist of here's what you do to make sure you, you do all the right things. And it's a self centered uh, kind of faith. It is one that it centers around what we do to save ourselves. And that's not the gospel because we can't do that. And so we must remember and always turn to the wonderful gospel truth of God's grace. And that is the only way by which we can be saved. He goes on to, 
emphasize to them he wants them to be filled. And there's two areas in which he wants them to be filled. And we'll see that in the verses to come, picking up in verse 9. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray this, that in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints of the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. The first area that he talks about is how he wants them to be filled with the knowledge of God's will. And this is important because uh, one of the things we'll see when we get to, into chapter two is there are those new teachers who are out there telling them uh, that they have a special knowledge that only they can know and understand and they can lead you to. But he says, no, I pray that God will fill you with the knowledge of God's will in all spiritual understanding and wisdom. Who does it come from? It comes from God. It doesn't come from our own understanding. And that's very difficult for us to deal with at times. That it is not something uh, that we study, that we examine, that we put into uh, uh, empirical scientific method and discern. But it comes to us through spiritual understanding and wisdom, which we'll see that new teachers are emphasizing too, but in a very different way. But this is, know what God's will is, seeking it through him and through the spirit that lives in our lives. Not the will of men, not our own personal will, but what is God's will. This will lead you then to live a life that is worthy of our calling. Again, there's similarities here to what he writes uh, to the church in Ephesus. Live a life worthy. Not that it saves you, not that it uh, is any value before God, except that you are living worthy of what has been done for you. Uh, I've shared with many people over the years that every time I left the house growing up, uh, either as a young boy or as a teenager, I was reminded by my mother, remember who you are. And she was not only referring to our family and our family name, but to the life that I had dedicated to Jesus Christ. Live a life worthy of that. Live a life worthy of being a child of God. And understanding how wonderful that is, the blessing that is there. So live like a child of God. And a big part of that is that phrase, bearing fruit in every good work. Again, this is not about earning salvation. It's about responding to the grace of God in our lives. And we seek to bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit in our lives in every good work. It's easy for us, again, uh, to make up our own list of what it is to be a good Christian. Uh, go to church a certain time, number of times per week. Uh, go to Bible class on a regular basis. Uh, and most of it are along those lines, and they are confined to uh, the being inside of a church building. He reminds them they should be do, bearing fruit in every good work in all of their life. 
whether they are together or whether they are out in the world. And those are areas which we must be looking for. Opening our hearts and minds. What is the will of God in this situation? How can I bear fruit? What is the good work here that God wants me to do? Uh, whether it is uh, sharing food with somebody who is hungry and homeless, whether it is reaching out to those who are lost and hurting in our world, whether it's caring for one another, the sick, those who are, are dealing with loss in life, what are the good works which truly bear fruit to give glory to God and all that he does? The next area that he talks about is be filled with the power of God in your life, which is described as having the endurance and patience uh, to continue on, uh, to continue to depend on him. And it is by that power that you can endure, that you can have patience. No matter what is going on in your life, no matter what's going on in the world, uh, no matter what others are telling you, uh, you should do that goes beyond or that is less than just the pure gospel message of grace of God and what it means to follow Jesus every day with joyful thanksgiving. Again, despite what might be going on in our lives, can we spiritually find thanksgiving for what God has done for us, what he will do for us, and the hope that we have in him, the Father. And it all goes back to him. His will, his grace that has been expressed through the Son, Jesus Christ. The Father who has qualified you, it says, has made you qualified to be one of his children because he has rescued you uh, from the dark forces of this dominion of darkness and has redeemed you, which has paid for and forgiven you of your sins in his son, Jesus Christ. Redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And of course, all of this does play out and is a major part of the life and ministry of Jesus Christ as it plays out uh, in the mission of God to return the people, the lost people of this world to him. And that is the focus of the next section and the last half of chapter one, which we will look at in our next lesson, that it's all about Jesus. It is through him that it's in him. And that's a phrase I want you to be looking for, that it's in Christ, it's through Christ, it's with Christ. Uh, any of those types of phrases that God has accomplished all these things. So consequently, we must turn to him and give ourselves to him completely and let him be the one who decides and determines what we believe and how we live and not other human beings. As Jesus reminds us, as he did his disciples in that upper room in John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. And that must always remain our focus. Not on the things that we come to understand, not on the things that we think, not our own traditions, not our own opinions, not our own inferences, anything else but that which is explicitly shared with us in God's word and by Jesus Christ and his life. And that determines the way we go. And that's going to be a major emphasis uh, throughout this letter. That is our beginning. There are many more things that 
Paul is going to share with us in the chapters to come in this very deep uh, discussion of the importance of making sure you focus on Jesus and not on human wisdom. We're going to see some similarities to the letter to the Galatians, which is his first letter written uh, about uh, 15 or 16 years before this letter. But the trouble there was those who were Jewish Christians who were trying to force a very rigid interpretation of uh, Judaism and the need for Gentiles to be circumcised, to follow the law of Moses, to follow all the dietary laws, and so forth, to be real Christians. And Paul uh, forcefully rejects that in Galatians. Now, a number of years later, he's dealing with a group of people who there's Jewish elements to it, but there's also Greek elements uh, that are being introduced into uh, the Christian world and Christian thought. And he's going to forcefully reject those as well. We cannot always allow the world around us to define how we think about God, how we think about Jesus, how we think about the Christian life. It must only be defined by Christ himself. And we come to an understanding of God's will through spiritual wisdom and then express it in bearing fruit in every good work. So that's given us the beginning. It's giving us a direction and a goal of what Paul is going to accomplish in this letter. And we'll see the importance that is placed upon the priority of Jesus in our next lesson and how important that is to us. Between now and then, I hope God will bless you and keep you healthy and safe. Thank you so much for being a part of this lesson today.